talking about concepts of manifesting, we can manifest until the cows come home. If we are being blocked, there's a systemic oppression at play. And that is not being addressed. We are not being equitable in how we are practicing or doing business. That block is still going to be there and we can manifest all we want. It's not going to make a difference to the systemic barriers that exist. We are represented. We are represented. We are represented. Welcome to Represented, the podcast. I'm Aniki Shiru, racial equity coach for online business owners who want to be intentionally inclusive by building a business that is racially equitable. I created this podcast to normalize the conversation around racial inclusion so that fear is no longer the barrier that gets in the way of doing this work. This isn't about perfection. It's about progress. Whether you're taking your first steps or you're well-versed in the journey towards racial equity, this space is for you. So welcome home, friend. Let's get started. listening to this podcast for some time and you found yourself asking, what can I do from here? I'd love to invite you to join the next round of my signature 10-week program, Represented. This is where I get to support online business owners on their racial awareness journey so they can build a business that is intentionally inclusive. If you've ever wanted to do anti-racism work, in a space that allows you to come as you are without guilt, shame, or judgment, then this, my friend, is the program for you. Enrollments are currently taking place with scholarships available, and we commence on Thursday, 10th October. Head over to anigishuru.com forward slash represented for all the details. Link is in the show notes. Hey there, lovely. Welcome to another episode of Represented Podcast. Today's topic is a little bit of a hot one, and I cannot wait to get into it with you. So let's talk about best practice. And when I say best practice, I'm putting it air quotes in it because it sounds like it serves everyone. But when you take a closer look, it often serves only those who set the standard. For too long, best practices have centered whiteness, excluding the need or rather the needs of underrepresented and underserved communities. And today, I want to take the time, and really, when I say take the time, I really do want to take the time to break this down into three main categories and peel the layers for you, so to speak, so you have a better understanding of how whiteness shows up in business and even in life and becomes the norm or the standard to aspire to. My first category is within corporate or institutions when it comes to dress code and professional appearance. We are in 2024 at the time of recording this podcast episode and a simple Google search of unprofessional hairstyles for work will bring up images of predominantly people of color wearing their natural hair. And I'm talking about braids, locks, knots, cornrows, afros, what we call within our Black community, wash and goes. Uh, Even in workplaces where they permit these types of hairstyles, they can be a barrier to promotions, leadership positions, or even pay rises. The state of California in the United States, joined forces with Dove in 2019 to create the Crown Act. Now, you may have heard of this. If you haven't heard of it before, it stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. Their mission is to end hair discrimination. Now, they partnered with LinkedIn and did a survey last year in 2023 And here are some of the results. I just want to share with them just to give you a picture so you can understand how far this goes when it comes to 
best practice and what's deemed professional. And I'll pop a link in the show notes if you'd like to read this survey a little bit further. So this workplace research study revealed that black women's hair is two and a half times more likely to be perceived as unprofessional. Approximately 66% of black women change their hair for a job interview. Among them, 41% change their hair from curly to straight. Black women are 54% more likely to feel like they have to wear their hair straight to a job interview to be successful. Black women with coily or textured hair are two times more likely to experience microaggressions in the workplace than black women with straighter hair. Now, remember last week I shared about microaggressions, what you need to know about microaggressions. If you haven't listened to that episode, I highly recommend after you're done with this one, head on back there and listen to that. It's an absolute uh, gem. It's full of so much information that has sparked conversation in my DMs, people asking, am I doing this? Or even I'm a, a, I'm a black person, I'm a person of color, I've said this, does this apply to me too? Is this a microaggression? And I'm digressing here, I apologize for that, but do check out that episode. And a couple more statistics here for you. Over 20% of black women, 25 to 35 years old, have been sent home from work because of their hair. I did not know that. That is a statistic that just caught me by surprise. And this was conducted last year in 2023. So you're looking at that uh, age group between uh, Gen Z and uh, millennials. Nearly 44% of women, uh, black women under the age of 34, feel pressured to have a headshot with straight hair. And 25% of women, uh, black women that is, believe they have been denied a job interview because of their hair, which is often higher for women under, again, the age of 34. And so take a moment to just let that sink in because you might have seen the the people within your networks, if you have people of color in your networks, or even just seen them within the workforce, in images, on videos, and just think, not, and not think much about their hair and the role it plays, but it plays such a big role and has been used as a tool to discriminate. And we're not just talking about Black women or even women of color in the workplace, but we're talking about in schools, the impact this is having on Black children. Uh, there are schools that do not permit them to come in with braids or cornrows or however way they need to wear their hair to in its natural state, it is not permitted and it makes it difficult because then in order to fit in, one may need to straighten their hair and to do that, that requires um, potentially chemically straightening it, which in the long run is just not right. Switching gears a little bit here and going to talk about clothing because clothing is also another area where we're seeing issues, it's not common to see colorful African prints in the corporate space. Have you ever asked yourself, why is it that in the corporate space, it is a certain particular look that is required? Um, and when it comes to this colorful prints, uh, they are frowned upon and it's potentially because they're deemed unprofessional. It's perhaps too loud. It draws attention to the person. It doesn't blend in. It's different. And when certain things are different, they are questioned under the scope of professionalism, which is code for whiteness. And if it doesn't fit the mold of whiteness, then it is not the norm and therefore is unprofessional. And then when we look at language and accents, Policies around professional communication often reinforce the idea that only certain dialects or 
accents, typically Eurocentric, are acceptable in professional settings. For example, African-American vernacular English or other dialects spoken by people of color may be deemed unprofessional. And even when you think of uh, the different voices that are used for advertising, used as uh, something that is to educate or you're going there to get some information, the way in which they speak, the language that is used, the accent is very Eurocentric, which again centers that and makes that the norm. That's what's best practice. But at the end of the day, is it really best practice? And that's what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, that was example number one. That was a or rather category number one, which was around corporate institutional dress codes and professional appearance. And of course, as you know, not an exhaustive list, but certainly something to get you thinking about things from a different perspective than you have before. Second category, the online coaching space and educational resources. There is heavy reliance on frameworks from white educators, whether they be authors, doctors, influencers in the coaching world. And they're used as examples for us to aspire to, or that's what's been shown to us. Let's take an example of case studies. Coaches often use case studies that are mainly based on the experiences of white clients, which don't always reflect the lived experiences of people of color. This makes it harder for clients from underrepresented groups to see themselves in the success stories. And what does this do? It reinforces the idea that certain outcomes may not be possible for them or perhaps it's not meant for them. That may not be the uh, what you're trying to do or what these people who are putting these case studies together are trying to do, but certainly the outcome may come across in a different way for people who are not seeing themselves represented. The other example here within this category is cultural context in personal development. Some widely accepted concepts in coaching, like manifesting, or perhaps you've had the phrase, uh, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, they come from individualistic or Western perspectives. They don't always align with uh, cultures or people from marginalized backgrounds where communal success is a big deal or dealing with systemic oppression might be more central to their lived experience. You know, we are dealing with things that have blocked us for years and years and years, for decades, for centuries. That is not really being dealt with here. And so when you're um, talking about concepts of manifesting, we can manifest until the cows come home. If we are being blocked, if there's a systemic oppression at play, and that is not being addressed. We are not being equitable in how we are practicing or doing business. That block is still going to be there and we can manifest all we want. It's not going to make a difference to the systemic barriers that exist. And that is something that is so important to take into account when you are, you know, uh, holding these spaces and having those cultural contexts being left out of place when it comes to our personal development. Another area is that I see and that is very, very key is when it comes to representation in training programs. Many popular certification programs for coaches are led almost entirely by white trainers. And here's the problem with that. It often leads to teaching that lacks cultural competence and may fail to take into account the unique challenges that clients of color face, whether that's due to systemic racism, bias, or cultural differences in how coaching is received. I'm going to take a moment to pause here just to let you digest everything I've said and perhaps take a moment to reflect on your own business. And if some of the examples I'm sharing here are ringing true, or maybe you don't have a business, but you're part of a program 
And just taking a moment to do that mental audit of some of the things I'm mentioning here and seeing, have you been made to think a certain way or not necessarily made to think or just the way you have consumed content? Have you consumed it from a lens that is speaking to the narrative of the culture that is most represented, the group that is most represented, the dominant group? Have you been made to consume that? Have you been in a position where that is what you're taking in and that reinforces the way you believe, that reinforces your beliefs? And in so doing, um, begin to exclude Let's look at category number three, and this is frameworks that ignore systemic barriers. I want to unpack the statement we often hear in the online coaching space, steal my framework or playbook to help you get six figures. Not that there's anything wrong with helping people do that. In fact, it is needed. But if your framework is based on whiteness only, to succeed, then there's a problem. And maybe you don't even realize it. I want to share some examples to just help with your understanding. Number one, networking and access opportunities. Some frameworks emphasize the importance of networking, but fail to acknowledge that people of color may not have access to the same professional networks or opportunities as their white counterparts. Mentorship and partnerships, often critical to success, may be less available to people from marginalized backgrounds, or sometimes on the converse of that, uh, is that mentorship is available, but it is limited in terms of opportunities being opened up in terms of you might know somebody who would benefit with what I have to offer, but you're gatekeeping. You're not making those connections. You're not making that phone call to make that connection happen. You're probably just uh, providing advice and going like, yeah, do this, do that, or don't do this, or this is the best way to do this, but gatekeeping and not opening up your networks, making that introduction and uh, potentially opening that opportunity in a way that may not have been possible for that person of color. The other example here is mental health and emotional labor. And what I mean by this is success frameworks often push concepts like grit or, you know, that hassle culture without considering the mental health impacts of systemic racism, microaggressions and discrimination because you haven't had to deal with them. People of color may need additional emotional support, such as trauma-informed coaching that most standard frameworks don't offer. And as a last example in this category, financial access and privilege. Many success pathways assume access to financial capital for things like business investments, coaching programs, or even self-care. They just make assumptions that there is finances available for that. However, generational wealth gaps and economic disparities between, between racial groups means that not everyone can afford to follow these same paths. Yet, the frameworks don't account for those financial realities. And so... What's coming up for you as you listen to this? Have you found yourself going through uh, a playbook or a framework and you're left thinking, I don't have access to this or this worked for you because you were accessible to certain things that I don't have access to? And that is where we begin to see the gap. We, get, we begin to see certain groups continue to excel and do well in terms of whether it's building their businesses or having successful careers, whereas the, the, the gap between black and white continues to become wider and wider. 
Why is that? Because the frameworks with which we are using to teach um, may be based on whiteness and in so doing, not taking into account that Black experience and the ways in which it becomes a barrier. Going to take a short break now. And when I come back, I'm going to share with you the ways in which you can build a racially equitable business that isn't just best practice, because we've seen best practice is not necessarily for everyone, but based on human practice and the key to uncovering unconscious biases. I joined Represented because I want to participate in breaking down the racist systems in our society that are excluding and harming people daily. This has been the best course I've ever taken for myself and my business. My biggest takeaway was that although I've always tried not to be racist, I was actually unaware of my own bias and privilege and the way my words and actions or lack of action could cause distress and even harm to, to black, indigenous and people of colour. I also learned that the process of decolonizing myself and my business will be a lifelong one. And thanks to Annie, I now have the resources and strategies for continuing to educate myself. If you're thinking of taking this course, I urge you to do so. Not only will your business become a safer and more inclusive place for people who have been marginalized, but you will also understand yourself better and grow as a human being. The course gave me so much more value than I expected. I'm so glad I didn't put off taking it when I did because this work is vital and urgent. Annie is a brilliant teacher with a deep understanding of diversity, equity and racism and she teaches with a big heart, so much kindness and love. I can honestly say your life and your business will be better for taking this course. Thanks, Amy. Welcome back, friend. Right now, the doors to my program represented are currently open and we are enrolling the most incredible humans. If you've been listening to this episode and something in your heart is just stirring and you're feeling like, I want to do better. I want to dig deeper into this work. Then I want to invite you to join us for this next round. And I want to share with you the kind of people who are signing up right now. Firstly, they are women of color who are saying yes because they want to know how white people may be more inclusive in their lives and businesses and better understand how they too have been excluded uh, so they can be in a position to feel empowered and not left like they're victims. They feel empowered to, to speak up when they're faced in situations where exclusion uh, has taken place. The other kind of person who's signing up for this work is emerging life coaches. And these are mainly millennials who are deeply connected to social justice issues. They want to build businesses with inclusion in mind from the get go. So they are setting up a coaching business to support those who need it the most, not just those who are represented the most. And seeing people coming in from corporate who are looking at represented as a great professional development tool for their leadership. That is something their employer can invest in for them. This is the 10th round I'm running represented and I know it will be incredible. Every cohort that comes in has a very different, unique uh, energy about them and uh, so much is learned through that 10-week period. It's truly a transformational journey. Now, enrollments are only open until the 3rd of October, and we commence inside of Represented on Thursday, the 10th of October. The next time I open doors will be next year, and the price will have gone up. So this is your opportunity to no longer put this work in the back burner and prioritize it so you are helping push the needle forward in racial equity. Head over to anigishuru.com forward slash represented to enroll. I cannot wait to have you in the program. We are represented. We are represented. We are represented. Thank you so 
so much for tuning in. Why don't you go ahead and hit that subscribe button and leave a review so this podcast can reach more online business owners and together we can begin to normalize racial inclusion in the online coaching space. I'd love to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where this podcast episode was recorded, the Wiradjuri people in central New South Wales, Australia. Music produced in Nairobi, Kenya by Patrick St. P. Mbaru and Kambua Mafu. Vocals by Joanne Matata.